Facebook yet. It shouldn't pop up until 10. Okay, so it's on the Backcountry Journeys. Not the tribe page, but just Backcountry Journeys. It should end up being on both. Yeah, it's not on there yet. Yeah, it won't until 10. Okay, well, I'm going to turn that down. Okay, I'll share that and turn my phone off when we get started. Anyway, I forgot the point I was going to make. But I, I, I feel like they're listening. So, yeah. Ready to. It's good. Okay, I need to get off here. Okay. Um, all right, and then I'll just silence myself. Hey, can you do me? Can you um, during the opening? Can you be sure to tell them to use the Q and A and that the chat is disabled? Yeah. Okay, great. Oh, well. We had some lady like just have a hard time last week, and oh, oh, and I and I tried to help her. I told her I would, you know, get in contact with her and help her with her problem, and yeah. she said we, she she said nope. Yeah, she let us know. We we did end up. It was good. It was all good. But um, I think if we let them know that, then it's just solves that issue before it starts. Thirteen seconds. Here we go. Okay, I'm off. Hey, I think we're live. I'm seeing a bunch of names pop in here. Uh, let me take care of a little bit of a technical issue, then we will we will get started on everything. Sometimes when you do these webinars, you've got two or three things you've got to juggle right at the first to get it going. Okay, hang on a second. Okay, got that going. Hey, welcome everybody. Uh, if you can uh, hear me, go ahead and see me. Go ahead and uh, pop in on the Q and A box and and uh, let me make sure everyone can see and hear me before I get started. I see some names in there I recognize, like Kathy and Roberta. Hope you guys are doing good. Noel's there. Uh, got a good group in here today. Hey, Adele. Hope you're doing well. Hughes back, my old friend from Texas. Linda's here. Yeah, I see a bunch of names I recognize. So glad you guys made it in today. Hey, and I mentioned it before because uh, we had a little bit of an issue with this. We've had a little bit of issue on and off in the past, but if you need to type a question in during the during the uh, presentation, use the Q and A box, not the chat box, because I am told the chat box has been disabled, so you can only type in on the Q and A box to. Uh, to uh, be able to uh, communicate with me. And with that said, feel free to communicate with me. You know, one of the things that makes this uh, uh, medium such a, a great way to present information is the fact that I like to make it a dialogue and not a monologue. So as we go through this, this presentation today, if you have any questions or comments about anything you may see it in the Smokies or, you know, any of the uh, pictures I took, how I took them, any of the techniques, equipment, anything at all, just feel free to ask and, and we'll get, and uh, I'll be sure to answer it as we go along. And I kind of like that dialogue part. It helps sort of carry, carry the uh, presentation a little bit better. And I feel like it makes it a little more interactive. Uh, one of these days, I hope we get, we can have a webinar where we can actually talk to one another and that way we can, uh, we can make it really, really interactive. But without further ado, uh, presentation today is called season of the Smokies seasons of the Smokies. And uh, I'm Russell Graves. I'm coming to you live from Hackberry Farm in Dodge City, Texas. We've had uh, quite the weather week this week. We haven't had any severe weather like they had up in Oklahoma and further down south in Texas. But we had we probably had five or six inches of rain this week. So I'm looking outside right now. It's overcast, kind of dreary looking. It's muddy outside. And so today's a perfect day for me to come live on a webinar. Uh, 
and bring some of this information to you. And today's presentation is just going to be kind of a free flowing, not any particular order, uh, just some pictures from the Smokies I've taken on my trips there, leading tours there for backcountry journeys and just talk about some of the pictures and talk about some of the locations and really what, in my mind, what makes the Smokies, uh, what makes the Smokies such a special place. In fact, we were asked the other day by the folks at Backcountry Journeys, what's our favorite national park? And uh, I told them my favorite national park is, is the Smokies. It's just, it's one of those things. If you've been there with me before, you hear me talk about that my family uh, doing the uh, ancestry DNA work that I've done on my own lineage. And my brothers actually traced our paternal lineage all the way back to where our name originated in England. But in doing that, we find out pretty, pretty, definitively that we are southern state settlers so all of my people came to the united states through north carolina through eastern tennessee on through across tennessee down into arkansas and then into texas before texas was even called texas so we've uh we're we're all southern states people and so that the smokies kind of feels like home to me uh kathy has a good question from from the start so as i go along kathy just feel free to ask and she says she wants to compare spring and fall option, the pros and cons of each. Uh, I can tell you the pros of each. It's kind of hard to say the cons of each one because both of them are special for their own in their own right. So when I say seasons of the Smokies, essentially we're talking about two seasons. We're talking about the spring and the fall seasons when I go. I, I, I've been to the Smokies in the summer before. I've never been in the dead of winter, but I have been in the summer on my own before. And uh, with that said, I, I didn't leave any of the – I didn't put any of those pictures in. These are just pictures of the trips I've led through backcountry journeys. And, you know, we lead off with this shot with the iconic picture of the Smokies and just sunset over the mountains. And that really nice stacked look that you get when you use the telephoto lens to shoot pictures of those mountains. The interesting thing about the Smokies, and I tell everybody this on the opening night of the trip, it's the most visited national park in the country. And one of the reasons for that is close to population centers. Uh, it's only, I think, two or two and a half hours, maybe three hours, or maybe I shouldn't even be saying that. It's not far from Atlanta, Georgia. It's not far from Charlton, Charleston. It's not far from Nashville and Knoxville. And it's not far from a lot of cities. And so you get a lot of visitation like that there. It's big enough where it's never really overly crowded, uh, but it is the most visited national park in the country. And number two, and this amazes people when I tell them this, there's no entrance fee, so you get in free. You just drive around where you want to drive, and, and uh, you don't have to pay an entrance fee to get in the park. And so, again, as I go through this thing, if you have any questions, I'm just going to go through kind of free form, tell stories about the pictures. And th this this particular shot here, this is probably one of my favorite places on the planet. This is actually Cades Cove. I shot this picture last spring on a trip. We'd had pretty much bad weather all week, overcast weather every day. I say bad weather. The weather's never bad. It never really stops us from doing what we want to do. We had overcast weather all week. The sun hadn't sh shined at all. And then the last evening of the trip, the last full day of the trip, we went out to Cades Cove and then the sun broke through and just gave us some remarkable scenes of the mountains in the distance in this big mountain valley uh, leading out before it. If there's any order these to these uh, slides at all, I've kind of grouped them into groups. Uh, we're going to talk about the trees. We're going to talk about the wildlife. We're going to talk about the flowers and talk about the water. And those are kind of the four main elements of the Smokies. And, uh, and if, if there are any kind of any kind of order, they're in that order. One of the cool things about the Smokies too is uh, is I, I never really talk about this much, and because this is a, just a it's just a, a a thesis of mine, I haven't really proved it. But the Smokies wasn't made a national park until the 1930s, 1934, I believe, is the original date. And uh, before that, it was that whole area was pretty well logged out. I mean, two thirds of the of the old growth forest had been removed by logging companies and the whole area had been really exploited. And so a, a forward thinking group of people got together and decided it was too special of a place to continue on the path that had been continuing. They want to preserve it for future generations. And so when you go to the Smokies, it, it's, there was a, there was a time in the national history of the national park when national parks were selected on the basis of monumentalism. So in other words, they had to have big mountain landscapes or something just really remarkable. I mean, that's why Yellowstone became the first national park because of all the thermal features that are there or Yosemite National Park or all the Utah National Parks, all predated places like uh, Shenandoah National Park or 
the Everglades or even the Smoky Mountain National Park that that really lack that overall. I mean, beautiful places, but they lack that overall monumental monumentalism that people are used to seeing when they go out to the big Western national parks. But it's a good thing they saved it because now when you go there, especially in the fall, and this will kind of uh, direct your question to your question, Kathy, that it's just the colors there are just unreal. And I live in a part of Texas, you know, and I don't know how many of you guys have ever been to Texas before, but I live in Northeast Texas. And when people think of Texas, I think the vision they get is what's been popularized on old Western movies. That it's just a big, flat, dusty plains. And, and uh, just, you can, you can see forever and there's no really big trees here at all. But the, the part of Texas I live in is actually not that. I mean, I live in kind of a, uh, I'm surrounded by woods where, I, where our, we built our house here on Hackberry Farm. And so we've got a lot of big trees here and I'm used to seeing the fall every year, but I, I thought I knew fall and I thought I knew fall colors until I went to the Smokies for the first time in the fall, because prior to that, I'd never really been out and seen kind of the iconic Eastern changing of the colors in, in October every year. But once I went and saw it for the first time, it's really phenomenal. And, and the, and the thing is I've been enough now where you start noticing the nuances and you start noticing it's like if you, some of you guys like Roberta and Kathy that were there with us a couple of weeks ago, you notice how the, uh, the trees start to get leaves on them from, from, from the bottom, from the lowest parts of the mountains to you get to the top of the mountains at 6,600 feet there in, at Clingman's dome. And it's still winter time. It was still winter time up there three weeks ago. And it, the fall happens the same way. Fall happens up high earlier. And is when you're there during the whole week, you start seeing it creep and increasing your rate at, it, at an increasing rate, the lower and lower you get in altitude. And it's just phenomenal to watch. And uh, I got off of my order. But when you when you go there, the, I guess the, the first part I'm talking about is the mountains. But when you go there, when, one of the things I always try to do at the first of these trips is ask people kind of what's that iconic shot you want to get of the Smokies. And more often than not, people will say a shot like this, just kind of that iconic view of the Smokies with all the layers and then the, 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 the fog down in the valleys and, and just this, the, the mistiness and the distance and that stack look like this. And, you know, if the weather cooperates and it normally does, it, we, we may not get it every morning or every evening because when you go there in the spring and in the fall, you're kind of in that unsettled season where the weather changes all the time. But more often than not, we're able to get shots like this and those really grand kind of overlooks. And then every now and then you get lucky and the sun breaks out. And you just get a remarkable view of the sun shining on these on these trees as they're starting to change in their into their fall colors. We've got more mountain views there. And it's it's one of those things that it's uh, and I talk about it all the time when we're here, when whether we're talking about the mountains or the water. You know, we we like like a lot of backcountry journey trips, we end up driving from place to place to try to get different overlooks and different views and different scenes and different subjects that we can take pictures of. And it's it's hard to uh, it's hard to pick out where to stop when literally every place that you drive by looks awesome. In the case of water, for example, I mean, the uh, you know, you've heard the old saying that that streams lead to creeks, creeks lead to rivers, rivers lead to civilization. Well, when the roads and in and, and some in some cases, old railroad beds were built in the Smokies, they were built along the easiest place to build. And that was adjacent to water. And so when you're driving through the park, you're almost always until you get to the higher elevations, you're almost always driving by some kind of mountain stream. And literally around every turn, you get this this incredible, these incredible views like this tree tunnel with all the colors on the left going looking up this stream. And uh, this is one of our stops we do every year. So if you're on the if you're on the trip with us uh, uh, just two or three weeks ago, we stopped here. That's by a waterfall called the Sinks. That's on the uh, Little River Road on, between the Sugarlands Visitor Center on the way to the Townsend or Cades Cove or the Townsend, Tennessee cutoff. And then when you start looking to the, you know, when you take some time to start looking off to the sides of the roads or some of the stops that we make, you find these little vignettes of water like the on the right, that waterfall is not huge. It's just maybe two or three foot drop. And it happened as a result of some recent rain. It's not there. It's not a permanent water feature, but just to see those little vignettes of nature appear there in front of you or at the bottom. And I'll show you some more pictures of this area. There's a, uh, 
there's an old trail outside of Gatlinburg called the Historic Nature Trail that that we we drive around through and look for bears. And uh, and on the hiking trip, we'll make a hike up to Grotto Falls, which I'll show you the, those falls in just a minute. And there's a stop we make that there's a bridge that crosses the uh, bridge that crosses the 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 river there. And then there's a cabin there, uh, you know, in the, in the spring, there's a bunch of flowers in the area. And then if you kind of walk and, and, and get off the road a little bit, you'll find scenes like you see at the bottom where it's just this beautiful moss laden rocks with all the water trickling through it. And, you know, we could, we could pay, we could pay landscapers a million dollars to try to go create something like that in our yard or at some kind of resort or some other, some other, kind of fancy place that people may want to visit and, and no matter how much you pay people to do it they they couldn't make such exquisite perfection that mother nature provides in just that one scene right there and it's just such a you know everywhere you look is beautiful and i you know i can't say that enough that's why it's my favorite national park it's just it, it you can i could spend a lifetime there and never take all the pictures i wanted to take there this is grotto falls a couple of scenes of it i you know this if you look at the picture on the right, it's kind of squeezed. I, I should have changed my composition on that. But, you know, when you build these slideshows, a lot of times I work off of templates. And so the template was already sized for this size. But there's a couple of different views of Grotto Falls. And, and they call it that because you can actually walk in behind the falls. Now, this is a popular spot, especially if you don't time it right. And one of the one of the things that I feel like uh, I've gotten pretty good at is being, a, be, being able to time when we go to some of these locations to avoid the crowds, but uh, a lot of people like to walk behind the falls and get their picture made there and then kind of walk to the other side and turn around. So this is the, uh, the picture on the left. That's when you walk up to the falls and see it, then you can go walk in behind it and you get to the other side. And the picture on the right is just a different view of the same falls taken from the other side. But it's, uh, it, it's, one of the things that we try to do too, when we get when we get our BCJ guests to these falls, is we we'll, we will uh, we'll hold up traffic if need if need be and just let people get their shot as it gets busier there. But again, we try to time it where we can get there, and there, there's just not hardly anybody at all there. We may not be the first ones there, but we're among the first half dozen to be there, so we can always get our shot and get that uh be able to get those pristine views like you see here. Because again, it is the it is the nation's most visited national park, so if you I found out most people aren't like photographers and I don't know if this is a gift or an illness or maybe a little both for people like us that like to take pictures, but most people don't, you know, they'll get it, get up at seven or eight o'clock in the morning, go eat breakfast at nine. And then about 10 o'clock, 10 30 in the morning, they'll finally get out there. And by that time we're long gone and moved on to something else. So as long as we, we can kind of work around those people's schedules and avoid that, that, tend to say depending on the time of year it is a 10 to three or four sort of time frame on these more popular spots we can we we never have any trouble getting pictures of it just some more water features uh from uh from a couple of the trips this this picture on the left is from the hiking trip that we did uh just a couple of weeks ago this is these are some fall uh, th three tiered falls that's up in the uh, Tremont area. It's a, well, you got to walk up a, an old railroad bed, probably a couple of miles up into the forest to find these, but it's still pretty incredible to see. It's just, and it's worth the walk, such a peaceful walk. And that's a part of the park that's really not visited at all. Or the picture on the right of the, of the moss, moss covered boulders and the fall leaves and then the water in the background. This is a, uh, this was taken just right off the road in the, in one of the fall standard trips last, last fall. So the picture on the left, that's that I, I mentioned earlier, that historic nature trail where you where you can there's a bridge that crosses the the, the uh, stream. And this is the stream that you can see. This is from right at the edge of the bridge. It's such an easy shot to take, but it's one of the more phenomenal water views that we'll we'll see in the park. And then the picture on the right is, again, just another another picture of a water feature that just formed right after rain. And so we, we spotted it and just stopped and took a picture of it. And I, I've looked for that same feature. I know where I took that. It's on the Little River Road uh, on the way between Sugarlands Visitor Center and Townsend Cutoff. And I've looked for that same 
little water feature over and over again and i've never seen it again so a lot of times you'll get these flows that again right after it rains they'll be there intermittently and then once they're gone they may be gone forever you never see that scene again and i think that's the case in that little that little waterfall there to the right because i've never been able to see it again Now, Kathy, I'm going to ask you this question directly, and Roberta, I'm going to ask you too. I can't remember. This, here's one of the great things about this trip. Now, this whole this whole abstract look you can do of trees, it's not a new look, and it's not a look that I haven't done before, but one of the cool things about being on these trips is, you know, the learning doesn't come all from one direction. I'm not the one doing all the teaching. In fact, I, I I can't remember, and Kathy or, or Roberta, you can help me out on this. I, I don't know if it was Sherry who showed some people in the group or if it was Kathy, or I, I may be wrong about both of those that started sharing how you do those slow shutter drags to get that abstract look of the trees, uh, like in this picture here. I, I think it was one of y'all, but when, when guests start sharing tips with each other, you know, that's just, uh, that's magnificent. When I, when I was a teacher, you know, for, for those of y'all that don't know my backstory, I was a uh, high school teacher for 16 years. I taught from 1993 to 1999. And one of the one of the best parts I could ever get to in my classroom was at that point when kids started teaching other kids in the classroom. When you empowered enough kids or they, they become comfortable around each other where they're willing to share their knowledge with each other, that's just a powerful teaching moment and learning moment to be, in, be a part of. Uh, and that's what happened on this trip when the other guests started sharing with the guests their techniques and showing them their equipment and get, sharing their equipment with them. It's just a it's a wonderful thing to witness on, on these trips. And Roberta says she thinks it was Sherry who shared this tip. But yeah, if you like that kind of abstract look of the trees, this this is was taken on the trip we did three weeks ago. I think it was three weeks ago. Sometime back in April, the time always runs together for me. And so that, you know, Tree, trees are a uh, the cool thing about trees is they're like people they're they're each one is an individual there's no two trees that are identical to one another and they've each got their own character and and uh like people i guess some trees are more interesting than others and you know it's all a matter of light and seeing the right picture when it a appears and really trying to celebrate the, the role of trees and not only our ecosystem, but in our, you know, in our popular culture and in our, just in our, our whole zeitgeist and the way we see the world. Uh, I think we're, we're better people when we can learn to appreciate trees because a tree is not just a tree. And uh, this particular morning was actually spring of 2021 and we were rolling through Cades Cove and we had a frost that morning. And, uh, and as the first rays of light came across the cove, you know, we found this, this a uh, little bit of tree line habitat or fence line habitat where the trees were still growing. If you notice, you can see an old fence that's growing along those trees and uh, just created a, a really remarkable scene, just kind of a quiet pastoral scene. And, and those are the kind of things I really like to look for when I'm looking, looking at landscape photographs. Cause really when you go to the Smokies, it's one of those things. It's, it's a, uh, it, it, just to compare and contrast, you know, if you go to, if you go to somewhere like Yosemite, you're wanting to take a picture of, you know, the El Capitan or Half Dome or one of those real iconic peaks. Or if you go to Arches National Park, some of the arches that are there, or if you go to, uh, uh, if you go to Yellowstone, you know, one of the things that we do when we do a Yellowstone trip is we always take people to see Old Faithful. And, uh, and those are those iconic views of those different national parks that, Really, I equate it to it's like a movie with having Tom Hanks as your star. There's one star. There's other stars in the show. There's other actors in the show, but there's one star that really stands out from everyone else. Well, the Smokies is like an ensemble cast. It's uh, really everything. It's the mountains. It's the trees. It's the wildlife. It's the flowers. It's the it's the cultural footprint that both the uh, Cherokee Indians and the the pioneers who settled there made on the on the region and on the area. And it's just how all those different tapestries are woven together and tell this grander story of this part of the country that's uh that's that was worthy of protecting and it's, it's just so when you tell the story of the smokies it's really telling a a story with with uh 
in different parts, but but it's the details that help make up the story. And so scenes like this, of this uh, frost, these frost laden trees at first light are just part of part of the scenes that tell that story. And, you know, y'all have also, this, so this technique isn't new either that we use a slow shutter speed and you zoom in on to make these abstract views of the trees. But this is also another, Smokies is also another good place to do this. This tree was right outside the Primitive Baptist Church that's back in the woods. And the reason why that's such a good spot to do that is because it's a, it's a maple tree, excuse me, it's a maple tree back there that you can see the bear, the, the trunk really good. The uh, the limbs and the leaves don't obscure the trunk, and so it makes a real interesting scene. Sh technique's really simple. Shoot with a slow shutter speed, and while the shutter's open, turn the zoom barrel on your lens, and uh, you'll you'll make an abstract view like that. And the you know the cool thing about digital photography is when I used to shoot film all the time because I've been shooting pictures for a long, long time. When I used to shoot film a lot, uh, I wouldn't try techniques like this. But you know now that my R5, when you put a couple of, when you put a, a SDX card in and the uh, a, a CF Express card in it, I mean, I've got 128 gig CF Express and a 64 gig uh, SDX card, which isn't, I mean, you can buy more memory than that, but just in those two modest size cards that I've got in that camera, it'll shoot something like 4,000 images before I have to download them. So take a lot of pictures. And so you might as well experiment on things like this while we're there. And the, and the cool thing about these trips are is, is that when we settle in a spot, there's so many different things that take pictures in one spot. You can literally be there for hours and still don't feel like you've covered it just because there's so much stuff there. Linda says, does it matter if you're zooming in or out? Uh, I, I think this is just my conjecture. This is my opinion, Linda. To me, they look better when you're zooming in as opposed to going out. Uh and that's me trying to figure out the same question, but I think they look better zooming in and out. But the technique I do is I'll just uh, use a cable release and hold it down. And while I'm while I'm holding down and shooting lots of pictures, I'll just zoom back and forth a lot of times. And then I'll even, you know, the shutter speed and the aperture staying static, but I'm zooming in back and forth at varying speeds just in a series of, you know, 50 or 60 pictures just to try to go through and pick out that half dozen that I think look the best in the end. So that's one of those techniques that there's no real, uh, you know, I can't sit there and tell you that, that so you'll get the same look every, if you shoot it two seconds at F 22 and at ISO 100 every time, it's just a matter of just trial and error. And I think that's, what's fun about it is just trying, just trying and trying and trying until you get it right. And then, uh, the thing about the Smokies too, when you go there, and I, sh I should have, I'll go back and show you this. If you notice the the water shots, I'm shooting with wide angle lens, but most of the, I didn't want to go back that far, but most of the mountains and the trees and the landscape shots, you'll you'll end up shooting landscapes with a uh, telephoto lens. And so the picture on the right there, just the close up of the fall colors in the trees, it's actually shot with a 70 to 200 lens. So for the most part, it didn't take a lot of exotic equipment to go there. The basic th three lens package, the 16 to 35 millimeter, the 70 to 200. Uh, if you got a 24 to 105, that's a great lens to use as well. And then some kind of telephoto. A lot of people use the 150 to 600 zoom. I personally, for the wildlife part, I've got a 500 millimeter lens that I use. Uh, it's big and obnoxious and, and too heavy to carry, but uh, I've had it for a long time and kind of feel like it's part of the family. So I'm not ready to retire that one yet. And, and, but when you use those bigger lenses, it allows you to kind of isolate and shoot those flat perspectives of, of these, uh, of the beautiful fall colors in those trees. And you can see there, it's not just the leaves that make the beautiful fall colors, but if you look at the color of the trunk and, uh, and even the green leaves behind it, it's just all, it's all those tiny little details that help make the story interesting. And the picture on the left, I can tell you exactly where that is. That's down the hill right before you get to the uh, the, the uh, uh, chimney tops picnic area. But that spot right there has the most beautiful patch of woods as you're going down the hill and you're looking off. If you're going towards Gatlinburg, you're looking off to the right. The most beautiful patch of woods with just a... Uh, just a remarkable view of the trees. And I think the reason why it's so remarkable through there is because you're not, you're looking at the trees in a, in a way where you normally don't see them. Most of the time we're standing at the base of trees, looking up at them, 
but the way the road comes down on the side of the mountain, you're actually looking at kind of midway at mid level through the trees, mid height through the trees. And it's just, it's such a, it, it's subtle, but when you see it and you realize that, you know, I, you know, I don't get to see trees like this all the time to be able to sit there and stare at them and just, you know, kind of that mid height view, it's a, it allows you to see the forest in an entire different way. And one of the things that I've really been trying to do is I've been, is I've been going and I, I would recommend this to everybody to one of the things I've been trying to, to do, and I've been doing it for a long time, but in the Smokies, I'm really, really, really trying to learn every species of plant and trees that I come across and be able to identify them, whether they have leaves on them or not. And last fall when we were there, I don't know why I'd never recognized this tree before, but it's, it's a, I think it, they, it's an ornamental trees in some parts of the country, but it's a tulip tree. And those things have the, you know, leaves that are this big around and enormous leaves. And they're just a beautiful tree when they start to turn fall colors. And one of the things that, uh, as we did a photo walk one day, I tried to try to challenge myself and everyone else to do is look for details that uh, really help tell the story. And, and and we were shooting at a time of the day when historically you don't think it's a good time of day to take the picture. And that's when the sun's more overhead. But but by looking and finding these trees that we could isolate against the blue sky and really back backlight them with uh, with with the sun really helps bring out the color in that picture. And the same way at the maple tree down below, just uh, trying to find a spot where we could do a starburst. And I'm not, I'm not great at starburst. I don't really, that's not my first default to try to make a starburst for an image. In fact, I think the lens I've got, I've got a different lens now I need to try it with, but the lens I was using on this picture does, it's not a, it's a third party lens and it does, it, it doesn't make good starburst anyway. So I've always struggled with starburst when, when I would use that lens, but I've since bought a different lens and, I need to try it out a little more often. Kathy asked to use iNaturalist for plant ID. Actually, Kathy, I use a, uh, it's a, it's an app by iNaturalist. It's called Seek, S-E-E-K, uh, is the one I choose to use. And that, that seems to work pretty well. And the cool thing about it is it'll, uh, it will, uh, it geolocates where you're at and then it kind of goes through its algorithms to figure out what plant that ought to be. Now it's not always hundred percent accurate, but it usually gets me in the ballpark. And, uh, that's my secret sauce when I'm there and, and I'm trying to figure out what, uh, what, what plant I'm looking at. And that's how I'm, that's how I've been learning them over time. Someone else asked a question and it was there, then it went away. So, uh, if you ask a question, I was about to, it was after Kathy. So if you're going to ask the question, I was going to, uh, if you want to ask the question again, go ahead and ask it. I just didn't get a chance to read it. Oh, Adele says plant net is good as well. I'll have to try that one. I haven't heard of that one before. Oh, planet net, not plant net. Planet net is good as well. Thanks for that tip, Adele. And I, I think you'd be remiss in saying that one of the, that, that the, uh, I'm always fascinated with the pioneer era construction. Full disclosure, if you've been on trip with me before, you've heard me talk about my love of building and, and how I do general contracting as, as a hobby. So one of the favorite networks I love to watch, any HGTV show or any, well, it's called Magnolia Network now. I love watching those shows. And so I love building stuff. And so one of one of my next projects, I'm actually uh, gonna, I'm going to build a log cabin on my property here. And so I've been really studying these cabins. And so I think you'd be remiss at saying that, that when you go to the Smokies and, and, and looking at the cabins is one of the things I always build into the itinerary because there's, they're, they're remarkable structures to begin with. And just when you start understanding the story of the people who were tough enough to live there before there were paved roads and all these utilities there, it's remarkable. Uh, it's a, it's a remarkable story. Okay. Adele says that, Plant net is correct. That that planet net was a typo. So plant net is the correct name. And uh, oh, and then Sharon asked the question. She was wanting to know the app, and it's called Seek. Oops, hang on. Let me go back. So all through Cades Cove, and that's where that's where, it's not the only place where these settlements have been preserved, but it's one of the places where most of the, it's the place where most of the settlements have been preserved. But through there, you'll see like this old buggy barn, this livestock barn. It's kind of in dog trot style where you've got a, where you've got a, you've got a structure on 
each side of it, and, and it's covered across the top to make a breezeway through the middle. But just the subtleness of the fall color in the background where this little series part, or the uh, uh, this is the, I'm going blank. It's one of the Baptist churches in Cades, Cades Cove. It's not the primitive Baptist church, but it's the missionary Baptist church is the one it is. And so you'll actually pass by, if you go through Cades Cove, you'll go by them. You'll have to get off the main road to drive back into the woods about a half a mile to go to the Primitive Baptist Church. But there's a Methodist Church, and then this is a Missionary Baptist Church that's there. And uh, this was when we were traveling through. And again, more the middle of the day, trying to make pictures and trying to think of ways to take pictures when you've got a blue sky overcast day and coming up with ways that you can shoot things like this, like this backlit church. And, and really trying to position yourself where you get the starburst around the steeple and uh, and really be, you know, we use this word a lot around backcountry journeys, but really be intentional about your composition. And I'm always talking about details. You know, I think, I think if one thing in my career as a magazine photographer, which uh, uh, I've had a good one and it still continues to be good. In fact, I've been keeping myself busy this week. I've had, I've had three magazine articles I've had to write and get all the pictures together for that. I'm leaving out for Amarillo tomorrow to do another story out there. And then uh, still got a couple more articles to write. But I think if anything has carried me in my ability to really take a lot of pictures for magazines is, is really an attention to detail. And I can't say that enough. It's, it's easy. It's easy to go see the big mountains and take a picture of the big mountains or to see these beautiful lakes with the mountain reflections. It's easy to see that it gets a little harder and, 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 and it's not impossible, but it gets a little harder to start seeing details and there's beauty in the details. And that's one of the things I always try to encourage not only myself to do, but anyone who'll listen that goes along with me, I try to get them to think about the details, like the textures of this, this millstone that's right outside of Mingus mill in, uh, in the, in the, uh, uh, in the Connell Lefty area of the, of the park, but just these fall leaves that fell right in the middle of this uh, millstone and just the beauty that's, that's held therein. just when you just take the time to kind of look close or the soft light that's coming through the windows of this and shining on these uh, pews in this, in this Baptist church here, or the, uh, or the, the, uh, the chalk marks on this big log when someone made this, uh, made this log cabin. And so to me, the chalk marks, I mean, that's, and I'm not trying to make an artistic statement with that, but the chalk marks, I mean, somebody's hand made those. I mean, there was a person like everybody in this webinar right now that, that picked up an ax and that put their own, you know, blood, sweat and tears into making that settlement for themselves and their families to, to hopefully be able to thrive in. And uh, just the, just the ability to, to be able to see those details and really extract those details. And that to me, that helps tell a story. I, I talk about this all the time to get off the subject a little bit. The, uh, uh, you know, when every, you know, I, I talked before that every story has, well, I didn't say this before, but every story has three main parts, a beginning, a middle and an end. Just like our stories as people, we have a beginning, we have a, we have a middle part of our lives and, we're all going to have an ending to our lives at some point, but we hope that what is going to make our, our lives and our legacy special is that those details that made up who we were in the, in the, in the, in the, in the all in the middle and those details are carried forward. Well, from a photography standpoint, that's why the details are important. It just helps kind of tell the kind of cohesively tie the story together and be able to help you as a photographer make sense, whether you're shooting for a magazine uh, assignment like I am, or whether you're making a book to try to remember your trip at the end of a trip, you always got to think about details. And and to me, the details I could talk, I could have a picture, I could do the slideshow of nothing but details on the Smokies and be able to spend an hour talking about everyone because that's how important that the details are to be able to tell a photographic story of any kind. Appreciate that, Dave, your comment. And this is Mingus Mill here. This is not my favorite picture I've ever taken of Mingus Mill but it's one picture I've taken of it. I just tried to find a picture that was a little less abstract and more representative of it, of the, the mill. But this is, uh, this is one of the longest standing mills in the park, but it's also high technology because one thing you don't see is the big wheel on the side of it. It's actually a turbine mill where the water flowed down and turned the turbine at the bottom of the mill. And, uh, and 
It's where farmers from the area would bring their corn, bring their wheat, bring their barley for grinding so they could either sell it or take it back and, and be able to make food for their families. But what's amazing about Mingus Mill is the technology and the sluice technology of how they divert the water from the creek upstream and move that water through through these log plumes down into this this mill. I mean, it's a, it's a it's a you know we take it for granted today that we could build all this stuff out of steel and and concrete, but uh, you know, steel and concrete doesn't have nearly the soul as as this wood has, and it doesn't have the life that this wood has. And, and things like this are they're they're a work of art. They really are. This is a spot I saw one time while driving through Cades Cove, and I thought to myself, I wonder, and there's another spot I found like this too, and I thought to myself, I wonder. So I went back after the trip was over and did quite a bit of research and figured out this is a pioneer road, that, an old pioneer road that goes through Cades Cove that you can see the trees growing on each side. And, and when you walk down through it, it looks like they even tried to cobble it to some degree because there's there's, even though there's a big rock there, it's mostly small cobbled rocks down through there. So I don't know if it was intentionally cobbled or if those are just the rocks that are left behind. But uh, you can still see, even though the uh, uh, most of the the pioneering families left in the in the 1830s, or they had a life estate to stay there till they died, even though they haven't needed these roads in a while, you can still see the 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 uh, imprint of the people that were there long long before we were. And then I think, you know, when you think about the Smokies, I don't think you immediately think about the wildlife that is there. And, and there, there is a lot of wildlife there. Uh, in fact, this, oh, well, I'm going to say in the two weeks we were there in 2022, we probably saw more, I probably saw more bears than I've ever seen there before. I can't, I can't remember. I know on the second trip we saw 20, 22 or 23 bears, if I remember that number correctly. And the week before that, we uh, we didn't see that many bears, but our encounters were really, really good. They were high-quality encounters for the number of bears we saw. So I'm going to say we saw maybe 10 on the first trip. So 30-something black bears in two trips. And, you know, you typically think if you want to see bears, you got to go to Alaska. And that's true if you want to see brown bears. But uh, the Smokies are an awfully good place to see, to see uh, things like black bears or turkeys or even one of my favorite animals, white-tailed deer. I just love whitetails. And then this 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 happened uh, right outside. This was not last fall, but the fall before. This happened right outside the vehicle. We're traveling through Cades Cove, and uh, I look up and I see a deer. I mean, we're creeping pretty slow through the Cades Cove, and I see a deer running in this this draw. And uh, so I we're right by a parking area, so I park and tell everybody that. There's a there's a pretty nice buck coming up right here, and then he tops the hill, and then this behavior right here. And anytime you can get an animal doing some kind of behavior like this, I mean that's that's the holy grail of wildlife photography is trying to shoot pictures like this. And that buck was actually making a scrape, and that's what you call it. So during the breeding season, and when we're there, their breeding season is called the rut. And when we're there in late October, it's it's typically the peak of the rut, so we get to see a lot of behavior like this. Uh, but they make a scrape and what they do is what white tail deer will do is they'll paw the ground uh, underneath the tree and it's underneath the tree is the key part, but they'll paw the ground and clear out all the leaves and, and debris from the ground. And then they'll urinate in the, on the ground. And then, but it's always got to be above a licking branch. And so once they go to the bathroom on the ground, once they urinate on the ground, then they'll reach up with their head and then they'll slobber all over the, the licking branch. And so if you're ever out in the woods and you find a bare spot of ground with some lines through it, if there's a broken branch above it, it's probably a, a white tailed deer scrape. And that happened just right outside of our vehicle. And we were there to see it because we were paying attention and, and we're ready for the opportunity when it presented itself. And uh, that just, that's the magic of being there and spotting the wildlife that we'll see there. And these are some of the bears and, uh, and Eastern wild turkeys that we saw, uh, on our trip last, not this past spring, but the spring before, just a big male black bear. And then that's a yearling cub on the right eating that that plant it's eating is the official name is called American cancer root, but it's also called bear root. And those things, bears love those things like they're candy and they'll eat them like, like you see eating like a popsicle. And then uh, 
uh, Eastern wild turkeys and full disclosure, I love wild turkeys too. They're just such a remarkable animal. So interesting and so unique and just really animated. And when we're there in the spring is when they're, they're, they're in their mating season. So we get to see them at their animated best when we see them there. And then we saw some groundhogs this year, but in getting pictures of them, we were traveling down the road and would see them on the side of the roads. But, uh, we often see groundhogs there, and then every now and then we get lucky and we get to spot a, a barred owl hanging out in the trees and are able to get pictures of it. And I, I guess it's me, but I, I love, when it comes to natural things, I love the mundane. I mean, I love bears and I love the big, you know, the wolves and all the really cool animals that you see when you go out west on some of these trips. But I, I'm I'm a I'm a fan of the mundane as well, and one of the reasons is I think about these animals I see, and it really connects a part of my either recent past or my younger self to to a memory, and you know a lot of that's centered around white-tailed deer because I grew up in a hunting culture, and you know white-tailed deer is what we we my family hunted and used to sustain our family. We were, my family was a we we I come from hillbilly stock, and we were we were farm to table people uh, before that term was even cool. We, that's just how we lived growing up. And the farm I live on right now is, is a mile from where I grew up. So I'm right back in the area I grew up from, but when I see a white tailed deer, it takes me back to, to a, a, you know, simpler time in my life or, or, you know, one of the things I love traveling, but I also love being home because every morning when I wake up, I'm greeted to about six crows that hang out in my front yard and it's like they're waiting for me to come outside and say hello to them so they can go about their day. And just to be able to see a crow like this uh, and be able to photograph it in just was in such an exquisite light, exquisite background and everything else. It's just I'm always going to take advantage of, uh, of of pictures like that or even this this sparrow on the right. Gary asked the question, how many years have you been leading workshops in the Smokies? Uh, I think five now, Gary, is the answer to that. And that's on multiple trips five, for five years on multiple you know, both the fall and the spring and on multiple, multiple trips, each one. And then that's that same white tail buck we saw making the scrape in the picture before. And this was actually from a couple of weeks ago. And this, if you look at the Backcountry Journeys tribe page, you'll see a video of this bear. Uh, but that, that bear, it, he's, he's got to be smarter than any physics mind that's, that, that's, uh, or any, any physics minded people in the, in the, in the human species, because I don't know how he did this, but the size of that bear, and I'm guessing here, he's probably a 60, 50, 60 pound bear, but he had figured out the physics of how to climb to the very tip top of this tree. And that tree's 40 feet high. I mean, it's up there and he figured out how to climb to the very tip top of it. And I guess that's where the best blooms are, or these flowers of this. Uh, I think it's a, it looked to me like a wide oak tree when, it, when we were there when it, but he figured out how to climb to the top of those on branches that are, that are that big around and never, you know, and if he had fallen, he'd have died. I mean, cause it was such an extreme fall for him to make, but he, he figured out how to climb up there and how not to break the branches over and, and be able to feed contently up there by himself. And we watched him for probably half an hour, 45 minutes, something like that. And when he got tired of eating, he climbed down and, found him a good uh, crook in the tree, a fork in the tree that he nestled himself into and then took a nap. And then we went off and ate lunch from there. But it's just, uh, it's remarkable to see things like that. And then this was on our, their three weeks ago on our first session of the Smokies trip, we, we got stuck in a, in a, you know, I said earlier, I was bragging about my ability to, uh, to manage the traffic in the Smokies when you do have traffic, the, the times you do have traffic and it's not all the time. But we were in Cades Cove, and unfortunately, if you get stuck in a traffic jam in Cades Cove, you're kind of stuck in a traffic jam in Cades Cove because it's a one-lane road that goes through there. But I knew, and I kept telling everybody, this is a traffic jam you want to be stuck in because someone sees a bear, and the bear is probably close to the road if it's this bad of a traffic jam. So we made our way through the jam and then got up into, uh, there's a, right by the Methodist Church, there's an iconic walnut tree that stands right in the middle of a field. And she had her three babies out in the out underneath that walnut tree eating walnuts. And I, I Kathy and and uh, 
Roberta, y'all were there. I mean, we watched that bear for an hour, maybe. I don't know, maybe not that long, at least 30 minutes, 30, 45 minutes. And we we had to, you know, serendipity plays a, a role in, in these things, but I, I always kind of feel like things work out like they're supposed to. But uh, right when we pulled up to the bears, it's like this, it's like if you watch the old uh, movie with Charlton Heston about Moses in the Ten Commandments, it's like the water parted and all of a sudden the cars parted and we had our perfect uh, parking spot right there by the bears. We're able to park legally because one of the things I always tell our guests is when it looks like no one else is following the rules in these national parks, we always follow the rules. So that's number one concern of mine is when we see a bear is we got to find a good parking spot, but the parking spot was right there. It's like the red sea parted. We had a place to park. We parked right there by the bears. No one had to walk more than 50 feet unless they wanted to, to get a good position for the bear. And uh, we sat there for a long, and as I'm going to quote Roberta when she says this, a long and wonderful time, one of her best memories of that trip. And so it was just, it was pretty nice to be able to see that. And to see how stalwart of a mother that she is with taking care of her three cubs. Because uh, I don't, I don't know if I ever, my wife may be a, a close second because she was a pretty good mother with, when she would tend to our kids when they were little. But uh, that mama bear, she kept her cubs all, they were always within, earshot of her pretty close and they never wandered off on their own. And I think the very last part of my presentation is talking about the flowers. I, I'm going to show you something. I was going to save this for a future webinar. I will save this for a future webinar, but I discovered a new lens this year and it's really kind of changed the way I see uh, the world. It's a 15 millimeter macro lens. And I said that right. It's a wide angle lens and it'll work like a wide angle lens, but it's also a macro lens like on this picture here. I might have been six inches from these flowers, but you can, I mean, you can focus all the way to the, where the, the lens will, where the subject will touch the lens. It's a macro lens, but it's, it's a wide angle. It's 15 millimeters. And when I took it to the park this year and used it for the first time, it really transformed the way I, I started seeing uh, different parts of the park, like these trillium flowers against this old stone wall that's there in the park. And then, uh, all throughout the park, you'll see, you know, like these fiddlehead ferns here when they start unfurling in the spring and just a, a beautiful geometric design that's, uh, that, that just grows out of the forest floor. And there's such a fascinating fern or these may apple trees or the may apple, not trees, these may apple plants that, uh, that for just a couple of weeks out of every year, they sprout out of the forest floor and they grow and they, they put on their flowers on the underneath sides of the leaves and put on their fruit, but they're pretty low growing, maybe eight inches tall. But to think about a shot like this and, and really try to shoot low and get the back, you know, this is one of those middle of the day shots when you can, when you look, you can find good shots to take. It may not be the classic lighting like we always learned in our individual photography educations, but you can still find compelling shots even in the middle of the day or, uh, or, that in the spring when we go there, the dogwoods are in bloom and they're just extraordinarily beautiful. And I don't care how well you try to describe how pretty those trees are. I don't think anyone's ever done a good enough job to describe how pretty they are. One of the things, and, and uh, we've had a couple of prior guests accuse me of making names up and I guess that's fair enough. And I don't make names up. I mean, they, they were, they were giving me a hard time about it, but uh one of the cool things about learning plant names is like the, the flowers on the left is a shrub that grows all over the Smokies and that's called a mountain dog hobble. And when I start saying names like that, people think I'm i uh, I'm making it up or the wild bleeding heart that's growing on the right. And those, those just little vignettes and those little details are, are, are just everywhere in the park. And there's a, uh, the picture on the left are our dwarf iris. I mean, one of the things I learned and I'm, look, I'm not a, I'm not a uh, professional archaeologist, but I like to think of myself as an armchair archaeologist, especially when it comes to rural building sites. And one of the things that you can tell, especially in areas of uh, of northeast Texas and east Texas, if you're walking around in the woods and you find a, a stand of daffodils or a stand of iris there, there was probably a house there at one time because it was one of the common plants that people would plant around their house to try to beautify it. And when you go to the Smokies and all of a sudden you see these irises that are that tall, 
and they're dwarf irises, and it's just a remarkable plant. You can't help but stop and take note of it. By the way, that was taken with a 15 millimeter macro. And these trilliums on the bottom right were taken with the same lens. You can see there, they're going from their phase of being all white to starting to turn pink. And when they turn pink, that's kind of their last, last stages. And then, uh, and then the, uh, on the upper right is a, is a plant called a, and it's, it's a flower. That's a flower. And it's not a typical flower. Like you think about in the sense of it's, it's real showy and it's real beautiful colors. But it's so interesting nonetheless. It's called Carolina Sweet Shrub is the name of that plant. And Gary asked the question, you have four workshops in the Smokies in 2023. Is there one that's better suited for fall colors typically? Uh, I'd have to look at what you're looking at, Gary. Typically, we'll have these in the fall of a... Uh, typically, we'll have these in the fall of the year, October. Usually, the dates are between about the 15th of October to the end of the month. And then we have another spring version of it when, you know, that's more kind of wildflower and wildlife and scenery related uh, is in the, usually in April, late March, early April to the middle of April of each year. So uh, I, I, like I said, I'm not looking at the calendar right now. I can, if you'll, I'll share my, I'll share my email address with you at the end of this presentation. If you want to follow up with me on that, on the dates you're seeing, then we can help, help you figure that out. And then some wild geraniums on the left, and then that's a that's a new little uh, a new little plant we saw on the right this year. We found that over by an old church in the Catalucci area of the park. And then once I saw it for the first time, it's kind of like when you're driving around, you know, like when you get the phenomenon when you get brought by a new car. Then all of a sudden, it's like everybody around drives that car. Once I saw this flower for the first time, we uh, we saw it everywhere after that. Okay, that's the last one. It's 12.54 right now, so we're running right on time. Does anybody have any questions about anything I showed you or, or talked about or, or rambled on? I mean, I think I hope you can tell that I'm pretty pretty enthusiastic of, of, about the Smokies. I just think it's a, a, a special place, and it's a remarkable place, and it's a wonderful place uh, to go, and it's just it's, – it's full of scenery like I showed you. I mean, every – Every and the reason why I didn't want to include the pictures that I took outside of a backcountry journey trip, I wanted to, to share with you the pictures that, that I took, the pictures I took in locations that I took other people to. So if I saw the pictures there, you can see them there as well. So all these pictures are not exotic locations that I mean, all these pictures aren't taken in exotic locations where I'm the only one that knows the 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 uh, the place where I went. I mean, these are all places I take everybody to. So. Gary says four workshops between October 16th and October 27th in 2023. Gary, I will, uh, I will look into that. I, you know, I probably should, I probably should admit to this, but I do not have the, uh, the uh, schedule committed to memory. So when, whenever you bring up something like that, which is great, I need to, uh, I need to, I need to, uh, take a look at that and dig a little deeper. Typically Gary on those dates you talk about though, typically we'll have a standard trip and then a hiker trip. So I, I you know, I, I could be wrong about this, but there might be a typo on the website. I'm not sure or not. Uh, but yeah, typically we'll have the, you know, the, and it all the order always varies, but we'll have a hiker trip, hiker version, which is uh, like the standard version, except it includes a few more walks up into the mountains and then the standard version, which is, pretty well vehicle based there is some walking around on that one uh but it's not we don't necessarily intentionally hike somewhere to get far off the trails to get back to a certain waterfall or anything like that so uh it, it may just be a typo you're looking at but typically we do we do a standard version and a hiker version in 2023 and then richard asked the question uh what type of camera gear do people take and then uh zoom and macro etc yeah, the three pieces, of the three lenses I mentioned earlier is a pretty good start, especially on the fall trip. And it varies a little bit in the spring trip. In the fall, it's typically a 16 to 35 millimeter and that you're going to use that for the water features primarily. The uh, 70 to 200 millimeter zoom is great for doing the mountain sceneries like you saw in this presentation. And then the the longer lens, the, you know, the, the four or five, 600 millimeter range is for the wildlife. Uh 
There is some need for macro in the fall, but probably not nearly as much as there would be in the spring because when the wildflowers are everywhere, Richard, one of the things I would recommend if you don't want to go out and buy a new lens, go spend a little bit of money and they're not much at all, maybe $100 if I'm if you buy a third-party brand, but you can buy a set of extension tubes. And what those extension tubes do is they'll turn like a 70 to 200 millimeter lens into a macro lens. And it, all it is, is a, uh, it's a, an, I don't have one here with me, but they kind of look like a teleconverter, except there's no glass in them. It's just a, a empty ring that you mount between the lens and the camera. And I'm, I'm wading into unknown territory here because I'm not a, I'm not an optical engineer, but for some reason, when you move the lens out away from the sensor and you put that extension tube between them, it, it affects the infinity. You can't focus to infinity anymore, but it makes that lens that will focus a whole lot closer than it normally would. So if you don't want to go out and spend a lot of money on some macro lenses, buy a set of extension tubes, play around with it. And for the longest, that 15 millimeter macro that I just bought, that's the first true macro lens I've ever owned. I've always used extension tubes, so and they've always served me well. And then Adele asked, what's the hiking like and how steep? It's typically, they're not, it's not it's not probably nearly as, as steep as what you've experienced out where you live, Adele. Uh, the, it's more of kind of a, a war of attrition. It's a lot of up and down. It's not, and it's not, there's never any really long stretches of up and there's never any really any long stretches of down but it's a lot of up and down over uneven ground. And so you're stepping over roots, you're stepping over rocks, things like that. It's not, it's not technically, it's not a difficult hike if you're used to hiking. I mean, it's, it's just not. And, and really because where they could, there, there are some really technical hikes in the Smokies, but we don't, we don't do those. But in a lot of these national parks and Smokies, including one of them, they built the roads by most of all the best places. And so any hiking we do is usually we can go to a remarkable place, but it's typically not very far from the parking area that we go to. In, in other words, we're not having to take 10 mile hikes to get back to these places, two, three mile hikes out to the spot, you know, so five and six mile round trips, that's about the ex longest extent of our hikes. And so on the hiking part, we'll usually do just some hikes every day and kind of build that aggregate for, you know, to hopefully get to that, 15 to 20 miles within the week. John, uh, Sharon asked the question, 17, 35 millimeter, can it be used as a macro? If it's got macro ability built into it, Sharon, I'd have to look at the manufacturer that lens to, to tell you that for sure. You can use extension tubes with those wide angle lenses. It's a little bit tougher and a little bit more, you know, just a little, it's a little bit more difficult to use. I would say if you're going to try to, uh, I was going to see if I've got that lens right here. I thought I did. No, oh, maybe I don't. Anyway, if you're going to, if you're going to try to use that, uh, if you wanted to shoot some wide angle macros, that lens that I, I've got is a, is, I don't even know how to pronounce the manufacturer. It's like Lawa or Loa or something like that. It's L O A W A. And, uh, that, that macro lens I, I bought costs 400 bucks. They're not that expensive at all. It's all manual though. It focuses manually and it even has an a manual aperture, but uh, it does work well. So, uh, you know, without knowing a little more information on your lens, Sharon, I, I can't really ask that, answer that. John asked, do you hold the camera for wildlife or do you use a tripod? Uh, you know, there's occasions when you do have to handhold, but I always recommend using a tripod, John, if you're going to be shooting a big telephoto lens, it's just going to make your pictures that much better. Uh, because no matter how steady that we think we are, we're not nearly as steady as what a tripod can make our cameras. Uh, Roberta says she rented it. I'm assuming the 15 millimeter macro. Is that what you're talking about, Roberta? She said she rented it last week and it was a lot of fun. So I think that's the lens she's talking about. They are a lot of fun. I mean, just that, and I'm not sitting here telling you that information is a, uh, as you know, I have, I have no kind of relationship with the company that makes that lens. I'm just telling you, it's a really, really cool lens to use. And it just, it, it, it made me see the world in a different way that I'd never seen it before. I never thought you could take a wide angle macro lens. I never thought you could take a, a macro photo in a wide angle before, but just the, just the ability. And I'll go back again, 
just the ability to take a picture like in the trilliums on the bottom right, really tight picture of the flower and, and, and really almost a one-to-one -one ratio. In macro, you hear a term called one-to-one, -one, and that means the, uh, the picture on the image is in relative size to the, to the uh, scenery around it. And so it looks life-size when you're looking at it on the frame. It doesn't look tiny or doesn't look huge like in a telephoto. And so you can get true one-to-one -one, uh, ratio on these macro images, but still see the habitat that it grows in in the background and to get a sense, you know, from an environmental standpoint of, of where that plant grows. And, and that's what I like most about it. Because see, like these bleeding hearts it's a, or this mountain dog hobble, they're pretty pictures of the flowers, but you can't tell anything in context of where it grows. But like with this wide angle macro, you know, you, you get, you get, you know exactly where it's growing because you can see it in the same picture. And uh, it's a, uh, like I said, it's, it's a pretty remarkable lens. All right. Anybody else have any other questions? Y'all been a pretty quiet group today, which that's okay. Uh, usually when people are quiet, I, I feel like I've done a pretty good job of explaining everything, but if, if uh, I'll still hang around for a minute or two, if you have any questions, if you need anything beyond this, if you think of anything after this uh, webinar is over, feel free to stay in touch. There's my email address there. It's Russell at RussellGraves.com. Uh, sometimes I may be a day or two late in getting back to you because I do get busy and I do have to travel from time to time, but I always answer emails. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to, to, to send me an email over and I'll, I'll be sure to answer them. So if, you know, questions can be gear questions, trip questions, anything else, just let me know. I'll be, be happy to answer them. And, uh, Roberta, I appreciate your, your comments there. It was a joy to spend time in the field with you and I hope to get, get to see you again soon. And uh, I still think about the smiles I saw on all y'all's faces every time we would stop it at one of these remarkable locations in the Smoky Mountains. And so that's the that's the thing that kind of keeps me recharged and keeps me going and and looking forward to going to the Smokies again this this fall. Uh, Cheryl asked, what are the top spots to see for mountain views? It's it's there's really a lot of them, Cheryl. I mean, anywhere along the. Uh, uh, the state line border between North Carolina and Tennessee, Clingman's Dome, Newfound Gap, any of those locations are pretty good. But you can you can really get good mountain views. One of the things I didn't mention is from our hotel in Gatlinburg, we've got pretty good mountain views there. And so uh, you can really get good mountain views just really anywhere. You just got to get out of the creek bottoms and get up to the sides of the hills. And so that's you know on, on just about any of the roads in the, in the park. Uh, Adele. Oh, it's good. I'm glad you're here, Adele. I'm, I, I appreciate you joining in. And, uh, you were thinking about me when you're shooting turkeys away from my house. Well, if you get, you get tired of them, box those things up and send them all the way to me. I'll gladly take them down here. I love turkeys. Hey, one of the things too, is this turkey. We don't always get pictures of her, but she's never failed us. This is a leucistic turkey. And now they're, you know, Lucism in, in birds is not super uncommon, but it's not really common as well. I think I read the number about one in every 10,000 turkeys. No, maybe it's one in 5,000 turkeys uh, exhibits this type of coloration. And so in other words, where it's where you see all the white feathers is supposed to be brown. And so that one turkey, we see her, uh, we may not get a picture of her, but I see her almost every year or every season I go there. And it's always, and it may not be the same one. It may be some of her offspring that those genetics may still be alive in that population, but it's always cool to, to get to go back and see that Turkey right there. And Sharon says, can't wait to see you for fall 2022 in the Smokies. I can't wait either. Uh, it's going to be a, a remarkable time. Like it always is. I look forward to getting to, getting to see you Sharon and look forward to the trip. All right. I don't see any other questions coming in. So I will go ahead and sign off for the day again. If you have any questions, russell at russellgraves.com. Feel free to send me an email. Uh, reach out to me and, and, you know, just ask away and I'll do everything I can to help you out. Take care, guys.